All right, hello everybody and welcome to our Family History Roundtable panel discussion, Traveling for Your Research. I'm Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors, and I will be moderating today's discussion. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history, and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Now, it's a common misconception that all family history research can be completed online. In reality, of course, there are treasure troves of undigitized records and resources in libraries and archives that are worth making a trip in order to take your research to the next level. There are also many meaningful experiences to be had when traveling for genealogy that don't involve sifting through records. Uh, many genealogists make trips to see their ancestral homeland and their uh, ancestral homestead or to meet cousins and other relatives. In this panel discussion today, our genealogists will discuss the benefits of traveling for genealogy and their tips and strategies for planning and making the most of your family history trips. We'll also highlight some of our upcoming research tours to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., for example, and other exciting locations as well. We have 45 minutes reserved for the panel discussion, and then we will have time for audience questions at the end. At any point during today's discussion, please go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end. There is no handout for today's discussion, but we are recording this program, and starting later today, you will be able to go back and freely review the discussion. Our panelists today are Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert and our Senior Genealogists Rhonda R. McClure and Melanie McComb. David has been on the staff of NHGS since 1993 and has published many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register and other publications, as well as the book A Guide to Massachusetts Cemeteries. His areas of expertise include New England and Atlantic Canadian records, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. Rhonda joined the staff of NEHGS in 2006, and prior to that, she ran her own genealogical business for 18 years. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of 12 books, including the award-winning Complete Idiot's Guide to Online Genealogy, and she is also the editor of the recently released sixth edition of the Genealogist's Handbook for New England Research. Her areas of expertise include immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, New England, German, Italian, and much more. Melanie is an international lecturer who presents on a variety of topics, including colonial through 20th century American military research, genetic genealogy, Atlantic Canadian, African American, Jewish, and Irish genealogy. She has had articles published in American Ancestors Magazine and 50 Plus Advocate. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome our panel on screen. Welcome, everybody. Hello. 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 <clears throat> all right, so um, to get us started today, uh, I wanted to ask you all, what types of places might people travel to for genealogy? I think for a lot of us, we might think of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City or the National Archives in DC, um, but what else is out there? Where, where else might we find records? Um, Rhonda, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Sure. Uh, so there are a lot of obviously archives and uh, that are local historical societies and whatnot, but courthouses shouldn't be overlooked uh, either. Um, I was helping a, a friend and colleague move across the country one time many, uh, you know, some years ago. And because he was moving, we had obviously a, a rental truck that had all his stuff in it. So we planned this large genealogical tour across the country as we were going and uh, we actually started that research in Nebraska. We actually hit that particular county in Nebraska hoping to do some research in the deeds and some of these were not available through family search uh, and as a result you know we made this stop. However, we picked the worst possible time to do it. Uh, they were actually having their uh, 
they were having some kind of vote. It was a voting day for them. Uh, however, the people there were super, super nice and they accommodated us, which I thought was amazing. Uh, I know that other places may not have, they would have said, yeah, go away, come back another day. Uh, but it was pretty funny because you know, we had not planned ahead. We had not contacted them and yeah, we showed up during voting but uh, we did get what we needed. So it was a, it was a good it, side trip. So. All right, great. David, uh, I yeah, think David, you have a story. Have oh, yeah. <laughs> I do, I do. Well, you know, genealogy trips are fun, but sometimes um, when you go on cruises, you think you're gonna basically rest, relax, hit the casinos. No, for me, I always try to plan, where am I gonna stop and is there a family connection? So when I was in, uh, cruise a few years ago, we stopped in Sydney, Nova Scotia. I went out and found the house of my great grandmother, died in in 1919, knocked on the door, and the fellow let me in the house. It was now a business, and I got to stand in the room where she died. But we also went to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, where actually I was doing some research on my grandfather's sister, who um, lived in Prince Edward Island. And luckily enough, they actually had her death record which I had never ordered before it was in the 1960s. It just made that uh, release. And I was able to find out the funeral home. Well, I thought, I wonder where that is. Well, I asked the archivist. Oh, that's only four blocks from here. So I had plenty of time to get back to the ship. I decided it's a work week. I'll go and find this place. And maybe they'll have funeral home records on my grand aunt. So I wander up. I noticed there's a lot of cars in the parking lot. Then I realized there's people standing on the porch. And I'm like, oh, there's a funeral going on. I probably shouldn't, but well, maybe I can find somebody who's in the office. I walk up to the door and then I see my reflection, realizing that I'm wearing a shirt that I bought from a conference. I seek dead people. I'm a genealogist. And realizing it's probably not a wise or comforting feeling for the family members to know that I am seeking dead people walking into their relative's funeral. So I about faced, walked back to the boat and sent them an email afterwards instead. How about you, Mel? decision then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I may not have had as much international travel recently. I also like to do a lot of local travel. So I will usually like to hit up local archives or genealogical societies within New England, perhaps maybe I'm just looking for some ideas for lectures or to even just give context on my ancestors. So for example, I went to like Mass Historical Society and I reviewed some of their earlier charitable Irish society records, which they also had some uh, records that talked about the emigration process. But what was it like for the immigrants when they came off and actually came off the boats and the agents that actually had to assist them? And it just gave me a little bit more context of like what it was really like as an immigrant to be coming in. So sometimes I find that you don't necessarily need to travel very far to learn more about some of important records that you can find maybe in your own backyard. Melanie. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so I also wanted to ask you all, you know, with online research, um, it's obviously still very difficult, but it can be easier to know what's out there. You can kind of do a Google search and figure out, you know, what records are on what sites. Um, but with so many repositories that exist out there, it can be hard to know what records you might be able to find um, at these on-site repositories. Um, so how do you go about beginning that process of discovering what's out there? Um, David, if you want to start sure. with this one. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, I try to think that I'm lucky that I live in New England and there's a lot of New England places that I want to visit. And some of them, they're further up north in New Hampshire. I haven't been there yet. So 20 years ago, you couldn't Google the public library or you couldn't, you know, find out if there was a catalog online. Now we live in the 21st century. So, you know, using Google as a tool and also using our great New England handbook done by my colleague, Rhonda McClure, that also will give you contact hours and locations on uh, how to reach a lot of these different repositories. But how about if it's a small town? So in Barnstead, New Hampshire, um, I need to find out how I'm going to go to a certain cemetery. Where are the resources? Is there a historical society? What do I do? I call the public library and I find out their hours. And sometimes the public library, Kathleen, may not be in the town itself. It may be in an adjacent town. It could be like a community library. And then I asked them, I said, in your Rolodex or your electronic filing Rolodex, 
who's the historian or genealogist who answers your reference questions? They give me that point of contact and I call uh, he or she up on the phone and then I find out, you know, where the historical site is. Will they be meeting when I'm there? Does the historical society have any catalog in uh, on the internet or is it in person? Or do they know enough about the collection that I'll find that there? Um, and then the other thing is true with the library. While well, I'm the librarian on the phone, I said, what's the best way for me to find out what you have in your local history collection? Because that's generally what you want to try to find or their reference collection. So with the combination of the internet and just you and the old fashioned telephone call has worked pretty well for me. How about you, Ron? So, you know, obviously you want to do your homework, as David has said, you know, prepare for your trip. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously, if there are online records, you definitely want to exhaust those. Sometimes, though, it can be difficult to find those. A uh, perfect example of that was I was actually looking for some records. And according to uh, Archive Grid, they were supposed to be, uh, surprisingly, at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, of all places. And so I contacted them because I could not find them in their catalog. And he said, yes, we had them a long time ago. I don't know what happened to them. I'm like, that is not the answer I want. Uh, I was also in contact with an archivist at UMass Amherst, and she was being very, very helpful to me with some Quaker records. There was an article that she had in this collection. And I said, you know, it'd be great if you wouldn't mind scanning that for me. She sent that to me. That article cited the very letters that I had been looking for on Archive Grid and actually said that they were at the New Bedford Public Library. So I went off to the New Bedford Public Library and emailed their, uh, you know, their archivist and uh, she got back to me. It wasn't something that they had digitized and put online, although they did have some things, but she did find the letters in question that I wanted and she digitized them for me. So sometimes even when you've sort of quote done your research, uh, you have to still dig deeper. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't think about that, you know, just because it said it was here and it's not there doesn't mean that it's not somewhere. You've just, you've got to keep digging a little bit and not give up so quickly. And I think with all the things being online, a lot of people are like, well, I'm just not going to find it. Um, and so, yeah, Keep, do, keep digging. It existed. And you just got to follow, like, follow the trail, you know. So. Definitely. I love the shout outs we're getting for public libraries. Definitely <laughs> wealth of information there and public librarians are an incredible resource. So glad we're driving that home here today. Um, so I also wanted to ask you all, how can we know when we're ready to travel for genealogy research? Um, obviously, there's a lot of effort involved in that and cost, and so we don't want to do it before we're at a point where that makes sense for our research. Um, so how do we know we're at that point? Um, Melanie, if you want to take it away on this one. Sure, and sometimes I find that travel for genealogy almost might come when you are in the right place at the right time. So in Several years ago, I was actually lecturing at a conference in Alberta, Canada, and I figured, I'm here, how often am I going to have the chance to go to the provincial archives, which are right in town? So I did decide to go out. Um, it was April, um, but it was April in, um, in Alberta, so it was, uh, it was snowing. And it took a, a, quite a bit of time for me to get my Uber out there, um, out there in the snowstorm. And by the time I made it, while I was able to get in before they closed, I had just missed the window on requesting a vital record for one of my distant cousins who was a clergy, who was a reverend out there. So definitely a lesson learned that like, while it's nice to go on a whim when you're there somewhere is have more planning with having enough time if you were trying to look at more records. I also found out there were some records I was hoping to look at were some of the Canadian homestead records. And had I had actually contacted them ahead of time, they would have told me they were already online. They directed me to archive.org while I'm on a computer screen there. You know, it's funny. I did a couple of trips, Kathleen, uh, over the years to England. And the first one, I had all the intention in the world. This is 1986. It's going to enter my senior year of high school. I'd already been doing genealogy for a while. And my grandfather and his parents came from England. So I decided... 
Well, we're going to go through Cheshire. I'll stop at the Cheshire Record Office and I'll order the marriage record or see the original county version of the marriage. I, I knew that I had to get one from the St. Catherine's House back in those days in London, but I thought I'd see some original register. Got really excited, found the hours. So, and that's, of course, writing to them. There was no you know, going on the internet in 1986. I got there, I sat down, and I told them what I was looking for. They had me sit in a microfiche reader. I'm like, microfiche? I want to see the original book. And they handed me the earliest version of the IGI, the old International Genealogical Index for the Family History Library. And I'm like, it's not going to be in here. I popped it in the microfiche. I looked up my great-grandfather's name. Yep, April 15th, 1898. There's his marriage. And it mentioned where. It's because my mother's cousin is a member of the church. And what they didn't tell me is a year or so before, they ordered the original record from London and already put it in the IGI for temple ordinance work. Okay, so I kind of felt foolish. So fast forward till a few years back when I went to um, England uh, for a conference. And I decided to take the train up to Cheshire and revisit where my ancestors lived. But this time I was going to go to the village where we came from. Well, luckily, I found a retired historian. Uh, he was a history teacher and a love for genealogy. And he alerted the press that I was coming. And he spent two weeks finding out in every cemetery where my relatives were. So I went to the cemeteries. I went to the house sites. It was like laid out like a private tour. And he only asked if I could take uh, he and his wife to a pub dinner. The pub we went to was the one my family had gone since the 1500s. So it was a win-win situation all around. Wow, that's a great story, David. Uh, I have a slightly different twist on sometimes going on genealogical trips. Uh, my uh, now ex-husband, but at the time when we were married, he is very into boating and we were always going on boat trips. And I am an indoor girl. I mean, I'm a genealogist, you know, I love my indoors. I love my books. And so about the only place you're going to find me outdoors for any expanded, you know, ex experience time is if there's a cemetery. And so finally, I made a deal with him that wherever we went on the boat trip, I got to go to a cemetery. Now, it didn't mean that my people were going to be in this cemetery because most of my people were New England and at the time I was living in Florida. Uh, but what it did was it, number one, it made me a little more anxious to go on the boat trip, sure. But what I was able to do was to learn about certain, certain things, certain areas. Uh, you know, I spent an entire day with one of my daughters at the Key West Cemetery. And uh, we got, you know, at, like all day. We were taking pictures. I was looking for fraternal insignias on the various tombstones. And in Key West, there's one cemetery for everybody, but it's siphoned, like it's kind of cordoned off. There's the regular cemetery, there's the Catholic cemetery, there's the Jewish cemetery, and so on. You know, by the end of it, she knew, you know, she was 12 years old. She knew Knights of Pythias, and she was quite proud that she knew this. We got back to the marina, and everybody's like, oh, what'd you do all day? And because everybody else had been out boating, out shopping whatnot she puffed up her little ch chest she's like we spent the day in the cemetery everybody visibly stepped back from that and was like okay crazy kid here and yeah but i also got to we went to the bahamas one time uh and i literally got to go to the cemeteries on the the various islands where we were staying and learned something about the fact that they were all facing east um, and, you know, all the tombstones were facing east. And it was really, you know, I just, I took pictures of all of them. I was like ahead of the curve for find a grave because I just wanted to preserve this because let's face it, hurricanes have come a lot there and I didn't want those people to be forgotten. So, you know, and then I went from there to a historical society on the Bahamas. And we have, a, you know, there was a lot of uh, loyalist connections between South Carolina and the Bahamas. So there were things I could learn. So even if you are not physically going somewhere where your ancestry is, if you're going and you're like, oh, I've got a free day to kill, look and see what else you might be able to do you know, walk around a, a cemetery and see who were the famous people of that area and what is it known for and things like that. I love that. Um, 
that's reminding me actually, Rhonda, of our Scottish research tour. I remember how excited you were that there was a cemetery nearby our hotel. So it's maybe all adding up. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we went at night. I'm sorry, Rhonda, go ahead. I think David and I actually scared some people on that trip. Uh, oh, yeah. When we yeah. were in that cemetery. We took <laughs> our poor we were... intern to the uh, cemetery, but she was really excited about going. And mm -hmm. uh, we, got, we got her back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I was thinking of of the there was a couple walking as we were going up the stairs to this other level and you had seen some tombstone and we were just going nuts over it. Yeah. And these people's eyes got really, really big and they sort of like did a little wide walk around us. <laughs> well, good thing David wasn't wearing his I seek dead people <laughs> shirt that you mentioned. That's true. Oh, you would have added day. to the whole effect. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I think you're absolutely right. I think looking at going to like a local cemetery or other things is a good way to learn about local history. Um, when I was doing like more of my blog, that was something I would do on business trips before I became a professional genealogist. I would do little excursions to the local libraries or cemeteries just because I'm already traveling. Why not? Why not go somewhere while you're there? Definitely. And this kind of segues into something else that I wanted to ask you all. So I know kind of earlier we were talking a lot about traveling to go to libraries and archives and kind of sift through these records. Um, but obviously that's not what everyone wants to do for their entire vacation or trip that they might be taking. Um, so I do know a lot of people um, will take a trip to visit for example, a family homestead. Um, and of course, the steps for doing that I know can vary country to country. Um, but what are some things that people should keep in mind when trying to locate a family homestead or make a trip out there? Um, Rhonda, maybe if you want to get started on that one. Sure, sure. I mean, the biggest thing is obviously when our people were living, there was quite some time ago. And so you need to expect that there is probably somebody living there today. And, uh, you know, that they may be happy to invite you in, but keep in mind that that is their private property. Um, I know that that there have been a number of stories from myself and other colleagues when we've been in Ireland and we've gone to places where they have just been super welcoming and you know, like opened up and said, "Hey, yeah, come on in," or you know, "Oh, that was the." what became our pig sty out in the back behind the house that is a favorite story of an uh, uh, an old colleague of ours marie daly that her family lived in what became this current family's pig sty so uh you know you just but it for that one alone it just gave me this this impression of you know that's poor like that is why they took the chances they did to come to America kind of situation. Uh, but I think you do have to kind of gauge uh, the, you know, the just the atmosphere. Certain areas are super, super helpful. And Italy is another one. If you go and visit a town and you tell them that your ancestors were from there, uh, the entire town's going to come and talk to you in many instances because they know your people. So, you know, but here in the States, we're a little more, hmm, you know, a little, little, little less trusting, shall we say. So you may, you may not get that, sure, come on in and take a look kind of situation. Uh, but, you know, at the very least, go and see it, even if you're standing on the, on the like street, the public uh, street, you know, you it still get a sense of where your people were from. So... You know, I have a good news and a bad news story from England <clears throat> from two different trips. So when I went most recently, I had mentioned that I found a historian and he had mapped out where we lived. Well, of course, you know, I'm that American that wants to knock on the door and take a peek inside and sit by the hearth and, you know, find all, you know, what still remains of when my family lived there. So our probably 200 acre farm that we own from the 1830s till the 1880s was still a working farm. And a few years before my trip, I wrote to, to um, this farmer in Cranage, England, and he sent me pictures indoors and the house was built in like 1607. And, uh, you know, thinking the same age as Jamestown, I've got to go in this. And, you know, he showed me the bed chambers, but I still wanted to go in. Well, a couple of years had passed since I had corresponded with him, figured he's still there. I've got the letter in my pocket. I go and well, the driver, my friend here, has taken me to this house. And he goes, why, do you want to go in? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm going to stay here. i got to make a call. You go up the path. I open up the gate, and there's the house. I'm walking on the ground. I felt like, you know, savoring every step and maybe scooping up some dirt. 
bringing it home with me. Then I noticed there were a lot of toys in the yard, like a lot, like preschool toys. And I'm thinking with gym sets and all that, I'm like, what's going on here? I knocked on the door. There's a woman is holding a toddler who is screaming. And she goes, hi, can I help you? Are you here to pick up your child? I said, no. She goes, well, I run a daycare here. And I'm like, oh, well, where's so-and-so? And she goes, oh, I've been renting the house from two years from him. He doesn't live anywhere in the county anymore. And I said, okay, um, is it all right if I have a look around? Well, who are you? I said, well, my ancestors lived here. And she goes, how do I know that? And she goes, how did you get here? And I'm like, uh, the car and the drive. She goes, why is he waiting? And I'm like, all right. Have a nice day. It was nice to see the house. Bye-bye. The better story was when I was 17. Now, my great aunt was still living in England, uh, in Canada, who had come over in 1910. And she had mentioned that one of her cousins uh, was still in Natchwich, England, where my grandfather was. Told me great stories of how he took my this lady, this cousin's hand, put it in an apple pie and made it sound like she scooped out the apples. And it was really my grandfather and about all these other, like, Really funny stories about a grandfather I never knew in England. Well, I visited with her and she said, well, let's go down to where your great, great grandfather lived on Station View Avenue. He had been a um, the sort of the watchman for the train and he would uh, work the switch and all that. Well, his house, nobody answered the door. But as I start to head back to my car, this is row houses. This little old lady comes out and she goes, hi, can I help you? She goes, are you looking for my neighbors? I'm like, no, no, no. Um, I, I, My family hasn't lived here for a long time. And she goes, oh, my goodness. Are you from America? Have you come back? And I'm like, uh, well, yes, I guess in a way. What do you mean? She goes, are you Samuel Wilkinson's family? And I said, my great, great grandfather. He died in 1946. I know. I knew him from the time I was a young bride. We were neighbors. He, and hold on, come on into my house, <laughs> brings me in, the whole family's having lunch or something like that. And she's like, now his house is exactly like mine, except that that fireplace is a little larger in his room. And then, but come on to the back. And she goes, and she gave me a little step left over the fence line to the neighbor's yard. She goes, see that pear tree? He planted that pear tree. And he told me he planted that pear tree in 1895. I still remember to this day. And she goes, I'll get you one of those pears. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say that was a great adventure uh the other one you know just goes to show you like Rhonda says and uh we, we advise uh if you're gonna go visit a homestead make sure the homeowner's home and uh obviously don't trespass <laughs> How yeah, about you? It, yeah and in some cases it's a matter of uh finding the homestead it may be you know somewhere a little more international um, so I have a lot of cousins over in Prince Edward Island, and I find that finding the individual farms where they are, it can help when you have the local knowledge of your cousins that are already living there as well, especially in very rural areas, because I have the deeds and everything that tell me where they are, but they have a lot more ways to kind of make sure you're not getting lost along some of these some of these roads, which can be good. And, you know, we regularly even advise people, like even at consultations, like someone will want to take like something like Griffith's valuation for Ireland and basically, OK, how do I map this over using the maps to a modern map and kind of show people? And we've we've done that before. We've done where we can show people, you know, based on this, this is likely where your ancestors were and these were their neighbors. So that, that at least helped people to kind of know where they were going. So they weren't going to Ireland aimlessly walking around a town and hoping to hoping to run across one of those friendly people that Rhonda mentioned that would tell them where their ancestors were. You know, and we should probably mention, uh, you know, give credit where credit is due. Rhonda has a wonderful web webinar on ancestral homelands. Um, yes. I think that you probably want to take that peek at that before you go on any adventure such as a homeland. Uh, Kathleen, I think you know when that's coming up, right? Um, I do. I can find out and we can put it in the uh, follow up email. I don't have the exact date off the top of okay. my head. I, I know say it's, it's in the April... future. I know it's coming up sometime. Yeah, I think it might be April 11th, I want to say, but we can put that in the follow up email today. Uh -oh. um, 
So I'm glad we kind of touched on some of the pitfalls that can come up when, uh, you know, maybe seeking out these ancestral homesteads. Um, a question I did want to ask you all is how do we go about approaching family um, that we might want to get in touch with that we've never come into contact before? Um, doesn't necessarily have to be abroad. It could even be family the next town over. Um, but, you know, how do we reach out to them to ask about a potential visit? Um, and what types of questions should we be prepared to ask them. Um, David, do you want to sure. go ahead and start? Um, again, piggybacking on another NEHS trip, um, back when Facebook was coming into uh, vogue and non-college students could get into it, I decided to create one for my family. And I was really expanding on my uh, Canadian roots and trying to find cousins. So I knew some of them I could find but then there were some other branches of my family I wasn't entirely so certain about yet, including my own last name. And I knew that my great grandfather had lived in a village uh, where he got married in St. Lawrence, Newfoundland. Well, I planned on taking a trip out there when I was uh, out in St. John to take a basically you could rent a van uh, with a group of people, different destinations. And I figured I'd find the family there months before. Well, I did. And I found another David Lambert. Well, this David Lambert ultimately turned out wasn't related to me. It was just happened to be a Lambert family that lived there. But we went to lunch. He took me all over the place. We uh, I even gave him a DNA kit uh, to test. That's one of the reasons why I found out we weren't related. Um, but it just happened to be coincidence. But I got to visit with local historians and people open doors because, you know, you know these families. But the same thing is true locally. Um, a number of years ago, when I went up to New Hampshire to look for a cemetery, my wife and I was in the middle of the summer, and she says, you know, this map from the 19th century, David, you have is not really doing us good. This is before, you know, GPS and all that. And she's, and I said, well, let me stop in this house here, and I'll ask directions. Well, we stopped at the house. It was the middle of the old farming area. And I went up, and I'm just about to ring the buzzer, and I see the name on the door was Pittman. That's my family name. Well, this lady answered the door and I explained who I was. She goes, oh, I know that cemetery. My husband's buried there. Hold on, I'll get in your car with you and I'll we can go for the ride. Now, she doesn't know me from anyone, but she got in the car with us. We went down there, inviting me back in the house because she happened to mention that she had a handwritten genealogy that was written by her husband's great-great-grandfather. Well, I'm reading it. And I realized that the house that I stopped in was the house of my third great grandfather's brother. And I was in the house and she goes, well, this is wonderful. Why don't you borrow this original 19th century manuscript and just mail it back to me when you're done reading it. So talk about a trusting uh, person who turned out to be a relative by marriage. So it's great, great stuff like that. Occasionally you come across. I find that starting a relationship with your cousins is definitely a good way to before you even approach that trip. So I've actually been in touch with multiple cousins on my clerk and clerk in line that run the area of people in the United States, Canada and Ireland. And I'm the mystery one there trying to figure out how I fit in. But we actually have like quarterly Zoom calls where we get on just like this and talk with each other about life and genealogy and and that many of them have already opened up doors to anybody within anybody within on this group to come for a visit and everything too. So I think that building a trust level with those relatives as well is really key because now should I, you know, have the the funds and the time to go over to Ireland or in, over to Canada, I have people I know I can actually trust to take me around or host me for dinner or something like that. And and know that, you know, you said it's, you're not relying on just a stranger hoping that they'll, you know, be ready to take you in, you know. And because of that, I think that friendship is really ended up. And similar to what David, what you said, um, they actually have their own version of a manuscript. They call it the Black Book. And it's basically their genealogy. And as people are um, dying or being born or married, updates are going through an email and updating the book. We're trying to keep it all up to date on this on this family going across so it's it's very much a work in progress and i think that collaboration is really key you know and to help ensure you know future travel um to be aware of any updates too 
And I'm sure you probably have done DNA tests with all of these cousins, correct? A lot of them actually already had. I actually met one of them. Was The first one was um, my cousin PJ. He was actually the first one I actually came across uh, with DNA probably over six or seven years ago. And we corresponded via email around then. And then it was only in the last like few years, really around COVID, when we started to do more of the Zoom calls. So to start that up, though. So we really were starting, you know, from uh, a very long friendship and going through trying to understand how we're all all related, though. So, yeah, DNA was definitely a way to open that door. Thank you. Um, so I see we're getting some questions in. And um, so something people are asking that I wanted to ask you as well is um, what are some tips for planning a research trip? Um, I know it can be quite daunting to kind of map that out. Um, you know, how much time should be set aside for researching? Um, how would you suggest going about planning that? Um, Melanie, if you want to get started on this one. Sure. Uh, so I have a couple of things I can suggest, though. So the first thing I would say is for any place you're planning a trip is you want to first find out, you know, when they're open, what events are maybe coming up, when they're going to be closed or unavailable. And then I would try to inquire if they have some kind of consultation or orientation service before you even go, because that will help you get in, in touch with their staff and help, un help you understand what are you trying to find at this repository to make sure that before you even get leave your home is there something you can even find there or is it something that could be arranged digitally or remotely through you know some kind of correspondence service or photocopy service because i can tell you a number of times uh, we've had a lot of patrons come into our library when we we're open and the, and then we've actually ended up showing them records that were online because they were digitized and they were not simply uh, like the manuscript materials we try to recommend that are unique that we would say those are the kind of things you'd want to you know really seek out. So I would say start off with like maybe like a consultation service. And I actually did that with one repository with the Center for Jewish History in New York City. Um, they actually had a, um, a consultation service online that they launched during uh, during the time of COVID. And they allowed me to just basically submit um, uh, a request I had. So I requested some synagogue records. Um, that I wanted to review, and she brought up an overhead scanner and, and a zoom on me, and had had the camera so I could see the records. Uh, only problem was is that the records were in Yiddish. Luckily, she could read a little Yiddish, so she could kind of do a skim through. But there were not enough really, you know, to, it was a little bit hard to really know for sure that my person was not quite in there. So that's one of those things that kind of showed me, okay, I might need more follow up, and I might need to go in person for something like that. Um, now, different places can also have different hours, too. Um, so when I also was going to uh, Corning, because when I was part of my one of my business trips, my, my old job, I went there pretty regularly. And I remember one time I kind of popped into the local history room, because again, while you're there, why not? And I had to, I saw this local history room and I wanted to get in, but it was locked. So I had to ask around all the different librarians, like, hey, can I go in there? Like, can you let me in? And eventually they found someone, but their because their hours were just really kind of funky. They weren't really like normal hours. You you had to go very specific times, and they eventually just let me in. But it was nice just to just be able to poke around and just kind of look around and see what's there. So sometimes you know going on a whim is not a bad thing too. When you can stop into like your local library or your local history room just to kind of see what's there and talk to the staff there. Because I was actually able to talk to someone there that was you know really knowledgeable about the local history and. You know, and I got a good contact out of that. And sometimes uh, my final thought I'll say is that um, it'll help sometimes to at least start an initial contact with someone, maybe via email first. So I was curious about a cemetery out in Kansas where my third great grandfather was buried. And because there was a little bit of confusion on was he buried out there or was it his son's grave and everything. And uh, he had actually um got me in touch. The pre I actually emailed the priest because I wanted to see if I could find a death record for him in their parish registers. They didn't go up that far. But what he did is he gave me the name of the head of this historical society. And he said, OK, here's his cell phone number. Uh, give him a call. Keep in mind, he's out in the farm, you know, doing his farming chores as well. So you might need to wait for him to come in. Um, but, you know, he'll, he'll be able to get in touch. And then I got in touch with him within about an hour after I called him. 
Um, and then he said, like, yep, I've actually been surveying that cemetery, you know, and I'll be feel free to, you know, basically do the old uh, uh, pull, pull in the ground, kind of poke around to see if there's any other graves in there. Because I wanted to see if there was another gravestone for my third great grandfather's son, Peter, if he was still there. So and that was good just to kind of get me in touch with someone at that historical society. So now that I know when I reach out to them, I know someone specifically I can reach out to. And I think that actually saved me a little bit of time to know I didn't necessarily maybe need to make a trip all the way out to Kansas. Absolutely. Um, so I see we're bumping up uh, against the question session. So I just want to get in a couple of questions before we turn to our audience. Um, and of course, go ahead and pop any questions that you have into that Q&A panel for everyone listening out there. Um, so I did want to ask you all, of course, we do offer um, here at American Ancestors research tours that allow people the opportunity to travel with us to different locations. Um, so this year we have research tours coming up to the National Archives in DC, to Ottawa, Ontario, uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland, and the Midwest Genealogy Center in Missouri. Um, and then, of course, we do our annual uh, trip to the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City as well. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about what to expect on these tours. Um, Rhonda, maybe you want to take it away on that one? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I absolutely love these tours. I love going on them and participating uh, as a genealogist to help the people who come on the tours. Uh, and I think that's one of the main benefits of the tours is the fact that we, the genealogists, we go with you. You're going to get consultations before we go and while we're there. And so what you're getting is Number one, we're going to help you hit the ground running, especially if you've never been to a place. We had a lot of people when we went to, uh, when David and I went to Scotland, who, when we were giving them the uh, their pre-tour uh, webinar, we were telling them, okay, you want to reach out to the archivist for this because it says it's off-site. And uh, so there were things that we could help prepare them for so that they didn't get disappointed while we were there. Um, I also love the fact that, you know, at some of them, we give lectures. Um, certainly in Salt Lake, we give a lecture uh, Monday through Friday. And, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things that, that they can learn that are more in general rather than a very specific thing. Uh, but it's, it's the biggest thing I think about the tours is the fact that everybody on the tour is addicted to genealogists to genealogy. We all love this field and we love digging and researching. And so there's a lot of camaraderie between everybody. And it's more than just a, oh yeah, we're going to go, we're going to dig in the archive. No, you're going to go to lunch and you're going to go here and there. And a lot of the people when we were in Scotland, which is one of our more recent ones that I remember the most, were, oh, we're going to go, we're going to you know, we've got tickets to go to Holyrood Palace or whatever. And a, a group of them would just go off one day and, and go do that. Um, you know, so it was, it was, yes, we're here, but we also feel comfortable that we can go and experience other things so that, you know, uh, you know, because we know that as a group, people know we're here, people know where we are. Um, and I think that if it's ever your first time going anywhere like this, that, you know, whether it be Salt Lake City, uh, Family Search Library, or, you know, our other international tours, that it's good to go with a group of people because Kathleen, who is our, our mama hen, will make sure that <laughs> she knows where you are at any moment uh, of the day. She's very good at that. But there's just this, this, I don't know, comfort, I feel, of knowing that there's a group of people who know you are here. And if we do not see you, we're going to hunt down and find you, uh, as opposed to going on your own, especially if you're a female, uh, you know, because we have we have things we have to be concerned about. So it's nice to go with a group of people. Uh, we do some like opening dinner, closing dinner. So there's times that we're all together and we're just really enjoying the fact that nobody's looking at us with those glazed eyes of, oh no, they're gonna talk about the genealogy again. So, you know, it's just all in all, it's a good time. I like to think of it as a genealogical support group um, because I mean, how many of us have relatives that, oh gosh, they're gonna talk about the great, great, great grandparents again. Uh, we all love hearing about them and the people you're hanging around with all week during the tour and having dinner with and maybe going on side excursions want to hear about your ancestors and I'm going to tell you about theirs and you're going to be equally as interested. 
but you want to plan side trips. Extend your trip if you can. Uh, may it be beforehand. You want to go and find that family cemetery or homestead. Of course, do the homework. Or maybe you're going to gather your information in an archives <clears throat> or one of the facilities we're visiting and then use that information and tag on a trip at the end. I mean, a lot of people have done that, including myself. Absolutely. And on these trips, though, besides like the like the, the dinners and the consultations, a lot of the time you also are going to be working independently. So that is something just to keep in mind when you're going to a lot of these uh, repositories is that there is going to be a time when you're going to be on your own. So you so you want to make sure that you're ready or maybe if you're not comfortable, maybe just make you know bring a research buddy along with you. We find that a lot of people will bring siblings or cousins or family member, other family members that will actually be part of that process. And it's, you know, it's a really nice bonding experience. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Melanie, you mentioned, you know, not everyone is maybe ready to bite off a, a research trip, kind of a full week dedicated to genealogy. Um, but we do offer day trips as well around the New England area. Um, so in the spring and summer, we're planning trips to the New Bedford Whaling Museum Research Center, um, to Maine Historical Society, Massachusetts State Archives. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of the benefits of those day trips as well. Um, um, David, maybe you want to take that one away. I know you've gone on a lot of those. Sure. I mean, one of the things I think a lot of people think of American ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, as being the end all for everything. I mean, we do have millions of manuscripts and thousands of books and a great staff uh, behind the reference desk and the, the whole team in general caters to the needs of our members. But there are places that have things that are not microfilmed or have never been digitized. Uh, and then some of these repositories we visit have their own equally important archives, like when we've gone to the Massachusetts State Archives. Now there's many things that the family search of digitized and put online, but not everything. I can tell you that because I worked there 30 odd years ago. Um, and th there are plenty of um, repositories that have museums connected to them as well. So you get to see not just the records, but see things that relate to your ancestors' story. I think that is so very important, not just to be concerned with the names and the dates, but to find the historical connections. Looking at account books and opening up that fan approach of family, associates, and neighbors, looking at things in these collections for the community that may indirectly mention your ancestors. Account books are a wonderful one. Diaries as well. For people that may not be your ancestor, but they may be included. Um, these repositories are great um, to have the capability for you to, you know, make scans, uh, or often you can just use your phone or your uh, digital camera. Um, most of the repositories we've gone to have been very um, open access. They've given us behind the scenes tours. Um, they've given us members of their staff to work alongside with us. So it really is um, a wonderful um, chance to work locally and think of yourself as a VIP for the day. Uh, and you're, then if you want to go back, you will have that one foot up uh, into the door, having already been there, and maybe you'll create a checklist of things you need to go back and see time and time again. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I would like to turn now to our audience questions, um, give everyone a chance to get some of those answered. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so first here, we had a question, um, someone looking for some tips on making a courthouse visit. Um, so they're wondering, how do I do this? And what should I know about asking to look through old records, especially pre-1900? Well, first thing I would say is if you're looking at an active courthouse, um, that is the first thing is understand what the rules are. Many times when you go into a courthouse, you may not be able to bring in a cell phone. You may not be able to bring in paper, pencil. So find out what you're allowed to bring in because you might have to memorize what you need to give to the, the clerk and fill out a slip basically for that form. So finding out if you're looking at like at a probate record or some other record that could potentially be sealed. So understanding what type of record it is. When it's something like mental health, that is very well restricted. So a lot of times, even if it's over 100 years old, you may not even be able to see the record. So you want to find out 
what are the legal issues around the record you want to see. And also make sure you do your homework and double check places like Family Search to see if it's already maybe already been digitized or can be made available from the from the court. So, and you know, in sticking with that whole, you may not be able to bring things in. We have a very unique archive in Massachusetts called the Judicial Archive, the Massachusetts Judicial Archives. It is actually on a floor that you can't get to from an elevator um, in one of our courthouses. <clears throat> and I had been in contact with the archivist at the time. She had pulled a uh, newer will. I was literally tracking a Bible from the 1700s and I was looking at this will in 1926 to see what happened to it. But anyway, I had this appointment and so obviously I'm gonna be taking pictures of this will and she knew I was. However, I get to the courthouse and I've got my you know, my cell phone, I've got a camera and he's like, yeah, you can't bring these in. I said, I'm going to the judicial archives. He's like, we don't, on the 17th floor. He's like, there's no 17th floor. I'm like, well, actually there is. And it was like this big drawn out process yeah. because here's the security guard saying, no, 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 this place doesn't exist. I'm like, I've been there before. Uh, and literally you would have to take the elevator to the 16th floor, then take a set of stairs up. Uh, but it was a, a situation where I was like, no, I have an appointment with the archivist. Mm -hmm. She's physically here. She has my file. And it was quite a bit of talking. And I think he even had to ask somebody before he let me in. Uh, so you definitely want to do your homework with the courthouses. And keep in mind that uh, the busier a courthouse is or the bigger the city is, the stricter your courthouse is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the situation I had with the Nebraska courthouse, there's no way in heaven if it was an election day, that they would have let us in if it was a like New York City or Chicago or something like that. Um, you know, so keep that in mind that the the smaller the area, the perhaps the nicer the people are going to be and the less uh concerned they are, just because they don't have the situations that the big cities have. And another plug for Rhonda's great guide to New England research, because all those probate and registry of deeds are mentioned in there. <clears throat> it's really important to know the hours and the limitations. And again, like Melanie said, look and see if it's already online. I mean, mm -hmm. it's one thing to look at the original in color, but if it's already there, you might be able to save a trip and do something else in the, the locale before you go to the courthouse. Thank you. Um, we also had a question that I bet a lot of people out there have. Um, what is the best way to get in touch and research at a repository in a non-English speaking country? Um, so this person's thinking specifically of Germany, but I'm sure folks are also thinking of Italy and, and other countries out there as well. So, you know, uh, I spent three weeks in Italy um, a number of years back on a genealogical research tour. I was all over the country uh, and I had specifically arranged with the archive in uh, Campobasso that I was going to go there to look at their military records. Uh, because in Italy, every every male, once he hits 18 or 20, I can't remember exactly, he, he's going to have to like show up and, you know, kind of like he's automatically drafted unless he's got something wrong. So I was looking to see this particular person's military records. I had been in communication before I traveled to Italy. And this was going to be towards the end of my trip. I started in Rome, I went south to a, a, another town, then I went to Milan and over to the east. So and Campobasso is down in the south. So this is towards the end of my three weeks. And not only had I been in contact with them before I, I traveled, but I had been in contact with them throughout my Every time I got someplace and I had, you know, my email again, I was like double checking with them and, you know, I'm going to be here on this date and everything. I showed up on Friday, the day I said I was going to be there and got in and nobody knew I was coming. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> I was told to come back tomorrow, which I did. Fortunately, I had planned the, like two days in that town because I didn't know what I was going to have situation wise. So I went back the next day and there was somebody there, uh, but Campo Basso was in the south and we had some issues with uh, the dialect. Uh, my formal Italian and her dialect were not meshing. We ended up actually communicating in French the whole time, which I thought was hysterical. Uh, but 
you know, you may end up with a situation where despite all your best intentions, you're still going to show up and maybe be told, yeah, we didn't know you were coming. You're going to have to come back tomorrow. So I always recommend if you are going to a place, make sure you've got a little flexibility in your travel schedule in case you get that kind of situation. Um, you know, and again, do your homework, know what they have, where they are. Um, there is a great book by I think it's Raymond Wright uh, that is all about German archives it's a, a big book uh, I Kathleen I will mm -hmm. include it uh, I'll send you an email with the the title and everything for you uh, and it gives you some of the records now it's an older book so it may be slightly out of date but it's a place to get started and then you can go online to the archives keeping in mind that if you are in some kind of a foreign country the, uh, the site's going to be in their language. Uh, you know, fortunately, a lot of our browsers now can do some uh, translation for you. But understand that this book, because it's in English, might be a great start for you, uh, specifically for Germany. But yeah, always do some homework about the archive, what their purpose is, who do they focus, you know, do they just do the civil, do they do ecclesiastical and all of that as well. Thank you. Um, we also got a question here from someone who's traveling to England, but I think this would apply for a lot of locations. Um, they're looking for a genealogist who can work with them there. Um, and they were wondering, do, do you all recommend specific genealogists or, or where would you recommend folks look for a genealogist to work with abroad or, or maybe even just an, in another state? Uh, Society of Genealogists in London um, used to provide a list of accredited researchers. Um, and of course, you know, there's the Association of Professional Genealogists, which do have international researchers. I mean, your best bet is if you want to work with somebody, you don't want to have to fly them in from across whatever country or whatever county you're going to or have to take a train. So uh, the other place um, in England is most of the uh, English counties have genealogical um, historical society groups. And there's probably somebody in that group, as I looked at with mine when I went to Cheshire, England, and that's the gentleman and his wife who took me around and I took them out to dinner. We had a wonderful time. So uh, so try the Society of Genealogists in London. Um, and then if that doesn't work on um, the APG list for researchers, uh, finding somebody again who's physically in the location you're looking for or can get to it. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, find out what their rates are. And you might be able to strike a deal. Maybe they need somebody with um, boots on the ground, so to speak, over where you're living. Uh, and you can trade research time or maybe trade a meal. There also uh, is the Association of Genealogists and Researchers in Archives, AGRA for short, which is also operated in the UK. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's kind of like a, the APG equivalent over there as well. Yeah. I, yeah, I recommend going through these groups because most of them have some kind of mediation option if you're not happy with yeah. like the person took too long, they didn't do right. what you asked, that type of thing. Uh, but it's really important. We, uh, I hired somebody in Italy for something that was needed uh, just this last year. And <clears throat> I was very, very specific with the person about exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. And the person, I had emailed three different people over there and this one person got who got back to me was very succinct and thorough and said yes I can do this I can do it in this time frame it's going to be this much money etc and then as we communicated back and forth about exactly what I wanted he sent me a list of the records he was going to look for and then I realized he had missed one and I said oh we need this one too this one's mo like very important because it ties to all these other people uh so make sure that you're you feel good about your communication but if you can go through an you know a body of professionals they often have some kind of method if you are unhappy with what what you've got absolutely thank you um i quickly want to answer a couple of questions that came in about the tours um so someone asked how many people typically go on these trips. I can let you know the Salt Lake City tour is uh, usually our largest. Um, that's often around 50 to 60 people. Um, but the other tours tend to be a bit smaller. I'd say around 25 people or so. Do you all think that that sounds about right? Yeah. That's, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had a question about um, can non-members go on these tours? Um, so certainly, yes, you yes. can. Um, you don't have to be a member of American Ancestors to go on our research tours, um, but you do get a big discount uh, if you are a member. So <laughs> you might want to think about that if you're planning on traveling with us. Um, so let's see here. I'll try to get in a couple more questions. Um, so we also had a question, uh, do any of you have experience um, or knowledge about visiting Masonic lodges that family members belong to? I thought that was an interesting question. Mm -hmm. As a Mason, I can answer that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't have to ask you if you're a Mason for us to answer it. Um, so the Grand Secretary of every Masonic lodge in at least the United States is the keeper of the records of each particular lodge. And of course, I want Rhonda to chime in too because she's given a wonderful lecture on fraternal uh, organizations. Um, if you contact most of the um, Grand Secretary's office by email or writing, explain that you're a relative. And I mean, it's someone like a, you know, a grandparent, even a parent, um, they're probably going to help you. If you contact them and say, I need everybody with the last name of Johnson who's ever a Mason, they're going to probably say no. Oh. Um, with Massachusetts, we have the um, the Masonic database from 1733 to right down to about 19, the 1970s and 1980s of members. Um, because I was a member of the Masonic uh, order, I was able to get and talk to the Grand Secretary. And I basically said, you can pull up an A to Z list on cards of everybody who's in your lodges. And I said, yeah. I said, can you tell me who was in a specific lodge? Because no, you'd have to know another list. Well, we made it capable so they could search on the lodge and then pull up everybody who's in that lodge. So usually it's a card. It's not a lot of heavy information. Usually we say the full name of the Brother Mason, their date of birth and place of birth, which is really great when it's a foreign born, at least in Massachusetts records, you'll get places in Germany or in Ireland. Um, it will say when they took the three degrees of masonry. It will say when they died or maybe took a demit, which means they left the Masonic order. Um, it may say if they were an officer, um, and if they were an officer or a state line officer, there may even be an obituary or biography on them that was put in in the Grand Lodge proceedings. Uh, but again, I want to turn to Rhonda because I know that she's had experience in this as well. So in addition to, I mean, uh, we're all spoiled with Massachusetts because we've got that great database. So yeah, yeah. not going to lie, <laughs> that is amazing. Um, but one of your biggest things when you right is usually they need to know the lodge mm -hmm. um the lodge mm -hmm. number and so one of the things that i suggest is that you look at um published books and so this is where family searches catalog can be especially useful because a lot of the <clears throat> individual lodges may have allowed certain of their records to be compiled into a publication and that up then allows you to get some information and usually it's the most that you would get anyway even from the from the grand lodge um, but if that is not an option and you're still needing to figure out the lodge I suggest turning to newspapers uh, to see what, and the city directories to see what the lodges were that were meeting. Um, city directories, especially, we all look at them because they're alphabetically arranged and we look for our person. Look at the front, all the front section stuff is so good, but they will identify all of the different lodges that exist. And as I said, the newspapers will often tell you where they met and when they met and so you may be able to use that and triangulate with where your person lived to see if that's the lodge that you need. Um, but again, you're not going to get like a full on biography unless they were a high up mover and shaker in any of the fraternal organizations. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, if they have some kind of uh, insurance benefits, such as um, and the Irish one is uh, escaping me, that is um, the Hibernians. It, not the Hibernians. Um, Order of Foresters? Yes, thank you. Yeah. The Order of yeah. Foresters. There's an index for uh, the Massachusetts ones uh, online. They've and actually. Then the, and then the cases themselves have been microfilmed by uh, Family Search. And so those often will give you death records and things like that. The Sons of Italy, another one that has benefits and will often give you information about, and the Italians are great because they automatically say, I am John, son of John. Just, uh, you know, that's just the way they are. And so you at least get dad's name. 
but you may get a death record. You may get some other things. Keep in mind that if it is one of the fraternal groups that caters to a foreign language, guess what? It's going to be in that language. So the records for the Sons of Italy are in Italian. Um, but look to see if they have some kind of an insurance counterpart because there may be some kind of collection that exists of the payments for that and so you may get death dates and you know who it went to and the relationship of that person who got paid i've seen registers like that as well thank you um, I know we're getting into a little bit of overtime, but just want to squeeze in a couple more questions because we have so many great ones coming in. Um, so next, we had a question here from someone wondering if you are a descendant of the enslaved and you're wanting to plan a trip to where they were enslaved, um, what suggestions would you give for that? So maybe finding that location and, and making a trip there. Um, any thoughts on that? I would say first getting in contact with the local historical society that's in the area, because first they're going to probably be aware of that plantation or, or area where they were enslaved. They also might know descendants of the original enslavers and see if there is an interest in starting a relationship to have you hosting an event, because you really need someone that is invested in helping you help put on that event if it's private property. So I would say really forging those connections at your local store site level, you may find that there are a lot of people that are trying com coming forward to make those reparations, even if it's just hosting an event or wanting to learn more about the enslaved. So I would start there. Great, thank you. Um, and then Melanie, this is probably another question you'll wanna answer. Um, we had a question about how to know what types of DNA kits to bring with you if you are meeting uh, new relatives. Sure. Um, yeah, so how, what would you recommend? I, I would probably suggest starting off with an ancestry DNA test because it is gonna be the largest database and it's, it's gonna be the easiest tools to use. And then you can upload that DNA test to other sites like MyHeritage, GenMatch, Family Tree DNA. I think that's going to be your best bet is just to bring that with you. And there's usually less issues of mailing that back to other places. So I would say that that would be the test I would take to pack along. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so as I said, I, I see we are in overtime. So I think we're going to kind of end the questions there. Um, but please do reach out to us. Um, you know, if we didn't get to your question, we do have a free chat service, um, which I encourage you to check out. I'll speak on that more in just a moment. Um, thank you to our panel. Um, and before we head off, I'm just going to share with you, I wanted to share some upcoming events that you might be interested in. Um, so first off, uh, I did of course wanna highlight one of our research tours. Um, this one's taking place next month. Um, it's our research tour to the National Archives in Washington, DC. Um, this is gonna be a really fantastic tour. Uh, we're gonna spend the whole week at the National Archives and we're also going to take a trip to Archives 2 on one of the days that week as well. Um, and you can find the full itinerary for that trip on our website and register there if you're interested. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about this tour. Um, and again, that should be a really fun one. Uh, then some other events that we have coming up. Uh, this month we have our online course, Demystifying DNA, Getting Started with Genetic Genealogy, um, which is presented by Melanie here and uh, ties in well to our last question <laughs> that we just had there. Um, a good one to check out if you are thinking of uh, getting a DNA kit to bring to relatives. Uh, the first class for that course was last night, uh, but you still have time to register and you can watch the recording of last night's class and join us for the final two. Then we'll have our online seminar, Writing and Publishing Your Family History, on February 10th. Um, there are course lecture recordings and materials that are available ahead of time, so if you register today, you would receive those. Um, and then there will be a live session on the 10th with the instructors. And then finally, we have a hybrid event on February 12th, introducing the 10 Million Names Project. Uh, this will be offered in person in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but it will also be live streamed online as well. You can learn more about these and all of our upcoming events at AmericanAncestors.org events. So thank you again for joining us today. Uh, you will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's uh, panel discussion. We really would love to see your feedback. This is a new uh, 
format for us doing the panel discussion. So we'd love to hear what you think of it, if you want to see more of these discussions. Um, as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar today was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about our upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org education. Thank you again, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future, and goodbye for now.